Uh, okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Samone. I'm a researcher at Demo Consultants and on behalf of BIM Speed team, I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar called BIM, BIM Speed Industry Day. We would like to use this session um, for knowledge sharing and uh, I would briefly introduce today's presenters. You can see their pictures on my screen. Uh, Timo Hartman will give us a short introduction about the project uh, Timo is a professor of systems engineering at TU Berlin and also the project coordinator of BIM Speed. Um, then Andrew Victory will talk about BIM digital strategy at Arcadis. Uh, Andrew is a member of the Arcadis Global Solutions team. Um, then Marco Ernesano will talk about energy efficiency assessment and performance benchmarking of buildings. Um, Marco is a professor at Universita Politecnica della Marca. And our fourth uh, presenter is uh, Agnieszka Lukavetska. Uh, she will give us an overview about BIM Speed pilot projects. Uh, Agnieszka is the head of uh, research and development at Fasada in Poland. And Oscar Bell Fernandez will talk more in detail about our Spanish pilot project. Oscar is an architect and urban retrofitting and regeneration technician at Vicesa. Um, we would like to uh, we would like to invite you all to contribute and participate in this webinar. So uh, two time uh, slots have been dedicated for questions and answers. Um, please do not interrupt the speakers while they are speaking. Uh, note down your questions and post them during the QA uh, Q and A session. And I would like to remind you that this webinar will be recorded and it will be available uh, on BIM Speed YouTube channel. Um, in order to minimize background noise, on this call, please um, mute yourself whenever you're not speaking. Um, so I think that's all for me for the introduction. So Timo, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Sama. Let me see if I can share the uh, short introduction presentation that I prepared. Um, this one looks okay. Does everybody see the presentation on the screen? And can you yes. hear me well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yes. Yes. Perfect. So also from my side, um, welcome everybody. Um, it's great to, to have you here today and um, great to see that you're interested in our BIM Speed project. Um, yeah, the BIM Speed project is funded by the European Union. And um basically it's a four-year project we are in year one so we have a couple of things to share but we're also quite at the beginning so as some already said it would be great to have your input and um your comments hopefully also your critical comments but um already now we also would like you to invite all of you to um, work for us also outside you know this short presentation meeting um, I will give a short overview about the project, um, prepared a couple of slides, we'll talk about the consortium, some background of the project, our vision, objectives, concept and approach, milestones. Um, one important part of the project is our demonstration cases, so we just don't want to just like develop new BIM methods or BIM working processes, but we also um, really intend to show that they can work in practice. and that's. Um, I guess one of the major objectives already, um, if we can show, we believe that BIM can support building renovation um, and can really make it efficient and uh, productive and you know, um, also economic. Um, the problem is that we think we have a good idea of how we can imp improve projects. And of course we develop these ideas further, but if we can show them as well as on the demonstration projects, we probably can provide good examples for all parties that tend to renovate in Europe and um, implement these technologies. Um, who are we? So we are um, a consortium of 22 partners across Europe. Um, you see our logos here. I will not go through each of the partners, but in general, we are eight SMEs, small and medium enterprises, three large industry organizations, um, two research organizations, three higher education institutions, one public body, and for EU non-profit professional, professional associations. So um, I believe we have a great consortium together that goes to the whole value chain of renovating um, a building. And um, so we can really leverage 
everybody's knowledge in this consortium to bring it bring together um, in our solutions. Um, a little bit of background, why are we doing this? Why are we motivating to do this? So in the European Union, the building sector accounts for around 40% of the energy consumption, 36% of the CO2 emissions. And for me personally, it's nice to see that, you know, um, the, the climate change and um, the, the ecological problems are on the top of the agenda. Again, everywhere in the media, everywhere we go, it has been a little bit silent. We were working on this for the last 20 years and we will continue working on it. Um, but we, as the building industry, have a significant part to play in there. I do need to can you see me? Everything good? Um, so most of our existing residential buildings have reached the age for renovation. 90% of the buildings were built before 1990, 40% were built before the issue of building energy performance standards. So, you know, we have these standards for new buildings, but most of the buildings are not built according to energy performance standards. And 75% of the buildings are residential buildings. Um, 85% of all renovation projects led, would lead to an energy reduction between zero to 30%. 10% of the renovation, you know, can, you know, lead to an energy reduction of 30 to 60%, 5% to 6 to 90%, and less than 1% renovations that target near zero energy consumption. So there's a significant um, impact that we can make by renovating these buildings across Europe. Um, so given this urgency for energy efficient renovation of residential buildings in the EU, the adoption of BIM um, can be the catalyst for smarter, more efficient renovation. So one of the biggest problems we have, we don't renovate enough. And renovations are expensive, they are cumbersome, people oftentimes even decide to demolish a building and build it new, which is the worst thing that can happen. Um, because we lose all the embodied CO2 and um, we need to find better ways um, to help actually the industry to renovate more quicker and better. And as I already mentioned, we, we really believe that BIM can help with that. Um, what's our vision? So we will, we want to develop a transdisciplinary process, a digital process to support energy renovation. Um, we want to also provide some, you know, not just like take state-of-the-art tools. We will do that and, and, and put them into a process, but we also want to um, tackle a couple of bottlenecks to innovative ICT developments. And um, one important thing is, of course, we need to look at the, at the, at the social and um, economic side. So we also will provide a number of social innovations that really can increase the uptake of BIM for building renovations. Um, we want to have focused attention on users um, we believe that the, the users, the occupants of a building, are really the key success factor for BIM adoption, but not only the occupants, but also everybody who's around in the supply chain, contractors, um, architects, um, building owners, and so forth. Um, and we want to develop ways for deep renovation projects to achieve EU energy efficient targets. Um, in short, um, we believe that, you know, if we, we can develop a process and innovative ICT developments that allow us to save 60% energy savings for each building to deep renovation. And we believe that we can decrease the time for the overall renovation project by 30% compared with what we do today. Um, so how will we do that? So the objectives of the our project are threefold. So first of all, we believe that we need to have an affordable cloud-based BIM platform that is really targeted towards energy efficient renovations that everybody can use, small companies, um, big companies, um, private people, renovating projects and so forth. And um, to this platform, we really make BIM widely available on the market. Um, to that platform, we also want to provide a set of interoperable BIM tools that support um, the overall renovation process. And of course, to really show and prove that, you know, our tools are market ready and can be um, 
taken up and they will lead to these overall goals. We want to validate and standardize the procedures for implementing renovation solutions with guaranteed energy performance and inhabitants comfort. And um, let me say a couple of words to this in inhabitants comfort. And in, in our opinion, this is one of the main issues that we need to take care. I mean, energy efficient renovation is easy, right? We take just all, we, we, we disconnect the building from the electrical grid and any other energy providing grids, but then nobody can live in these buildings. So it needs to be this balance that we have an inhabitants, a comfortable way of life for the inhabitants in the building that is at the same time energy performing. Well, um, so a couple of words about the process that we envision. So we know for renovation, it's very important to understand the existing building and the existing behavior of the building. So we envision a process that really starts with collecting and understanding data of existing buildings. And then from that, creating what we call a BIM passport um, that really can describe the building well and that can be used for all participants in, that need to make decisions in a renovation process, but also create um, libraries and families that can support the modeling of BIM based on the collecting collected data of a building. And then we really believe that as a next step, we really need to think about how we can integrate different BIM renovation solutions. And we talk about solutions here because in the renovation process, you really think about products. So you choose different new windows, new HVAC systems, facade elements and so forth that you somehow integrate in the building. And you have a, a wide range of choices for doing this on the market. So how to choose the best things need to be supported by performance analysis and optimization of the building. And we believe that, you know, the digitized the, um, um, version of a, of, of a building can help doing that. Uh, that leads us to a holistic performance and sustainability assessment before we start the renovation work, then helps all the engineering procurement implementation um, and so forth of the optimal renovation strategy that came from our performance assessment in the first place. And then as a first place, of course, you know, we need to also look at BIM facility and asset management and the renovation project should be almost something that is continuously improving the energy efficiency and the comfort of the building and not something that happens every 10 to 20 years. Um, so the interesting part, what we often hear is, yeah, so why should we renovate now? We renovated all our buildings 20 years ago, right? But um, energy efficient products and solutions move on, of course, and we need to be able to always implement the latest solutions. That's why step five is also very important. Um, what are we going to do on the project? A little overview about the work. So we are now, as I said, we are in year one. Um, we already launched the BIM platform. I will say a couple of words about that later. Um, uh, then we work really hard on um, understanding the current situation of BIM for renovation, which we publish now in a couple of um, deliverables soon. Um, then we will talk about um, our s builds data acquisition method. So we will research these in the next year. We will have an EU BIM competition. So we are looking for uh, innovative renovation projects that use BIM. Um, and then we will work in year three and four mainly on the market uptake um, till the project is completed. Um, I already said we have 13 real demonstration cases all across um, Europe. Agnieszka uh, probably will talk more about this later. Um, and then, as I said, we really look for an active participation. We don't want to be just in our little BIM speed bubble, but we need all your input and all your help, right? So we already said we launched it, our cloud-based BIM platform. Um, you can use it, but you need to contact us because we need to be a little bit careful because um, there will be a lot of data stored and data storage is quite expensive and that can blow up. But if you really have a meaningful use on your project um, for a BIMS platform, it's a common data environment developed by um, CSTB. It is used in France. Um, please let us know. Um, look out for our European competition that we will launch in about one and a half years. Um, if you're interested, 
get involved, use our tools, best practices and methods and provide, of course, feedback. And the most important thing is, you know, um, discuss with us um, and discuss and always works also about criticizing us so we get smarter and better um, to your help. Um, a little word about our common data environment. As I said, um, if you want to use it, you can feel free to do so. It's um, Crocky. It's called Crocky. It's developed by CSTB for the French market. We translated it into English. It is available already. And if you have a meaningful use of, of it, you can let us know. We will allow you to use it for free. So that's a big thing that we can offer already. You see, you can store your files there and it has all the features that you would expect from a common data environment, like discussion functions, um, um, history functions, um, task schedule planners, and so forth, right? So if you don't, uh, cannot afford Autodesk 360 or you wanna get started with using one of these tools, um, uh, contact us. Um, of course, it needs to be meaningful use and not just try out and, and upload like terabytes of data just like that. But we are happy to, you know, work with you on that. Um, what we try to do in this meeting, and some already said that, as a next step, we want to talk a little bit about BIM strategy. And uh, we have Andrew here that's going to talk. Is Arcadis is one of our partners, and Andrew is going to introduce the BIM strategy at Arcadis, and then hopefully we can have a little bit of a discussion of, you know, how the strategy relates to, you know, renovation projects, which is the focus of our project here. Um, then we will talk about building performance benchmarks and our demonstration cases. And um, that's my brief introduction. Um, I don't know if you have some questions already or some discussions. Otherwise, I would suggest we continue directly with Andrew. Um, I pass it back to you, Summer, as the moderator of this. Yeah, I think uh, um, uh, uh, it's good if you uh, give the permission to Andrew to share his screen because I'm keeping an eye on the chat box. I don't see any question coming at this moment. So right. I think it's good to continue with uh, Andrew's presentation and then uh, um, we can see yeah. the questions during the Q&A session. I think you should just be able to share, Andrew. Do you see the button? Oh, yeah. The button? Yeah. Yeah, I can see the share button. Uh, let's see if it lets me. Yes, I think it does. Great. Okay, I will share yeah, and just let me know. I do see it. You do. Okay, good. Yes, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, thanks again for the opportunity to to kind of give you a little bit of insight into what what we're doing our Cadus and, and how we're trying to move BIM forward as, as a company. Um, you know, we're, we're a large global uh, company of 27,000 staff and sort of scattered around the world um, in, in most continents you can think of. Um, focused between, we're kind of mixed between design and engineering, across the commercial management and business, business advisory. And obviously BIM for the design and engineering piece is, is a big part. Um, I'll start with just a little slide about what my role is. So I, I used to be known as the global BIM lead and in the last month we've kind of um, change that a little bit more because we're supporting digitization for the whole of design and engineering but so the title now for myself is the global digital transformation lead um, specifically focused on design and engineering um, what my role is is basically to to work with all the countries and where we have a country lead for BIM and GIS for example and, and other aspects of that as well like cost of commercial management digitization and seeing you know what where are we engaging on, on aspects of what of the things that are changing in our business, such as, you know, robotics and obviously drones for reality capture and point clouds, um, internet of things, BIM for digital twin concepts and, and methods, and then, then automation and generative design with a long-term plan, of course, of, um, of moving towards more asset management um, opportunity for our clients as well and outcomes for that as well. So, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm fully focused and you can see it in bold there on one to three years ahead. So, you know, the things that you'll always see from myself, or you, you know, you'll see in the slide deck, talk specifically about what are we doing internally over the next one to three years. I mean, and, you know, the funny thing is, is our industry is moving so fast that three years is actually quite a long time now. You know, we're often talking about the year to 18 months where we start seeing some big changes. So, you know, things like robotics and drones were definitely nowhere near as far as um, they were like two years ago. Robotics is still at the beginning stages, really, of, of us trying to understand and determine what it means. But the drone side has definitely moved very quickly. 
Um, I thought I'd include this slide about, um, which is a two years old, this slide actually from the UK, which was um, called the future of construction. And it spoke about some of the things that really are impacting our business or our industry as a whole. Um, and, you know, a lot of these won't be surprises to yourselves, you know, um, and as I said, this, this, this slide is about two years old and it has BIM in this one. It was because it was a UK project, a UK slide. It was actually had BIM focused on infrastructure because that's initially where a lot of the focus from the UK perspective was. It was around, you know, transport projects in particular. But, you know, you can see areas that have been emerging around prefabrication, modular construction is starting to kind of develop and mobilize in specific markets. You know, construction, autonomous construction is moving uh, moving quite fast around the robotics for certain parts for diggers and things like that. Um, augmented reality has been moving and has always been moving for a good five years now, really. And then it's things like 5G, which are going to emerge, and cloud, cloud collaboration, which is, you know, is, is an area as well I know that Timo is focused on. And reality capture, BIM, um, you know, BIM, as I said, and, and, and the big data analytics side and 3D printing and additive. I mean, the advanced building materials, I think, are still, um, are still a far way to go to be where, where we would see a good um, way to uh, pr propose that within our projects. But it's definitely an area that we, we keep an eye on. So all these areas have played a part in terms of our transformation and, and have had an impact in terms of what we do with BIM, for example moving forward as a company. So what we did um, is we actually tried to articulate, well, what, what sort of BIM are we doing and what sort of digital propositions are we doing undertaking within the business? And we categorized those within four or five areas and specifically, and it was focused around the Penn State documentation of um, that, that was a fair few years old now, um, which was around the gather, generate, analyze and communicate and realize BIM uses. But we, we stretched that further than the BIM use um, methodology and, and, and categorization that had been used from the Penn State documents. And we started to um, articulate that as digital propositions that we can give our clients. And a lot of the things now that are emerging and we're showing, you know, are things like scan to BIM, drones, um, mining of data, for example, clash detection, reality capture, 3D printing. And what I did with this is that we worked with the business to find out, well, where are they, what are they actually doing with digital and with BIM and, and what are they engaging? So what you're seeing here is basically where the BIM and GIS world both gave input in terms of what's happening around this, this side for data capture and also what's happening within the data analytics team. And so you'll see some of the data analytics services down the bottom there, such as city analytics and things like that, which will play a part obviously with BIM moving forward and energy analytics and, and stuff like that. What we've done is also we've done some color coding um, around where we have computation, uh, community of practices that are, are trying to, um, are, are engaging together regularly to talk about what they're doing in these spaces and, and how they can help each other. Because the idea in the end from a company like Arcadis is to, is to start connecting this data up and, you know, seeing where, for example, if we're doing scan to BIM, how can that support generative design potentially? Um, how can cost databases have, have uh, you know, give, give it added info and added value to our clients and, you know, obviously augmented reality and IoT pieces playing the part of that as well. So, you know, we're focused around within BIM, the 100% BIM program I've been responsible for for the last couple of years that was put together by um, our CDO, Brown Mommers. Um, it was purely focused around, um, around four topics, four key areas that are, are helping support and categorize. So the first one was around marketing and communications. So, you know, one of the big, it's actually a really big important thing with a big company like ourselves to make sure that not just for external marketing, but it's actually more for internal marketing. Uh, that people are aware of the things that we're doing. So we do a, look, a great deal around case studies and using of BIM. And we, we, we articulate and document when a country is doing a new type of BIM um, that they have not an, addressed or tackled before and made sure that that's communicated across the globe so that everyone knows that these are the sort of things that we now have specialties in, we have subject matter experts in, and then that people can kind of engage and support each other through that process, especially where clients are starting to you know, ask the questions. Um, the, the thing we've always done internally, and it's and, you know for other companies on here that are needing to, to kind of move BIM forward, I, I would highly recommend that we, we always focus in on the outcomes and the benefits. That we we rarely talk about the technology within those within those articles, because the minute we make it a technology thing, it it, it kind of uh, pigeonholes BIM into becoming um, more about a technology and a software and, and a tool, and people might switch off and feel that it's not relevant and. In, and relevant to themselves. So it's much more important that we make it a softer approach and they, they realize that why, why they should do this and why it's beneficial to them. One of the other key areas is, is around the people. 
Now, the people is actually one of the biggest things to do with uh, BIM and digital transformation. Uh, it's actually people transformation as well. It's one of the key areas for us that, um, as a company, we're doing. And this can end, this ends up happening in a, in a series of different categories. I mean, I'm just got a few here, for example. It's to do with like things like recruitment. You know, so for recruitment, we start adding BIM skills into the recruitment process. We work closer with academia, such as Timo and, and others as well, to make sure that we try to to, to find out you know, how we can bring the best in class forward for ourselves and support that and give them opportunities within our business. And also we, we do for some of them tooling assessments. You know, if, it, if it's a specific tooling that we were expecting them to do with BIM, you know, how, how capable are they and what, what does, what's their role on the projects as well. And we also do a great deal in moving much more around the strategic workforce planning. So it's, it's about considering, okay, so we have people available that can do these specific um, tasks in BIM in a country. Well, how, how can we make sure that we spread that knowledge and maybe spread the, 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 the workforce for that project across the, across the globe to help that? Learning and development is another big piece. It's the obvious one always with people, you know, learning and development. Um, and we've, we've always found, and we've typically found this in the last couple of years, that there is no one way that you need to do this. It needs to be in multiple ways, really, for learning and development to happen appropriately. So we have to take things on, like doing it just in time, you know, having scheduled training going on. Um, and, and allowing people to have on-demand training through e-learning solutions and things like that. Um, and have no doubt that also project-based experience and having mentoring with that is really, really important. Um, and, and they're all done in combination for our staff. Um, the other major one, um, which often gets frowned upon or doesn't get, gets, doesn't get looked at properly, is, um, is the community of practices. It's the communities and networks, which is actually a key area for, for moving a business forward. So we have, you know, as I said, we have community practices for reality capture. We have community practices for virtual reality and augmented reality. IoT has community practices. And, and these people all help support each other and have regular calls every sort of six weeks to sort, sort of find out what's happening. How can they help each other? Where are their pain points? And what can they do? We also do a great deal about internal conferences, which, um, you know, Timo has, has helped a great deal with in the, part, in the past about digital transformation. And we make sure that we invest in people for external um, subject matter conferences, like for, for the main technology vendors, and then also for ones where it's not, when it's technology agnostic. Other areas specifically around people, what we, we have to tackle and we regularly have to review is things like the career framework. You know, what, what are the people's jobs on projects at all levels, from senior, senior leadership all the way down to people coming straight out of university? You know, what, 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 are, we, what are our expectations from them around digital? And around BIM and you know and, and we work closely with human resources with that it's important that doesn't happen in isolation without the full human resources group being part of it things like onboarding are important you know planning planning how staff are going to be brought into the business and working out you know what are they going to have to learn in those first few weeks giving them a mentor around that if there if there's a specific task around BIM and making sure they know where to turn to and obviously the the compensation and benefits you know people have often focus when we say compensation and benefits being on financials, but you actually find most people, it isn't about the financial side of them, compensation and benefits that's important to them. There's a lot more to it than that. So there's things like them, them feeling that they are progressing and that they, have, they feel valuable for the company and they feel that, you know, that the company is investing them in terms of learning and in terms of upskilling for their future as well. So these, you know, these are just the people section. So as I said, we have marketing communications and people as, as two of the key strategic areas that we focus on. But there's two other ones, and they're kind of obvious um, strategies that are used in the past, and that's to do with process. So you're going to see people process technology. That's the three obvious ones you're going to see in a minute. But just looking at process, you know, um, this is focused around specific parts. So, you know, there is operational and technical processes that we look at. So things like how can we standardize how we do and deliver BIM for our projects. We focus on maybe object libraries, content, content that's being created so that we don't replicate. Um, things like templates as well are reviewed. You know, have we got BIM execution plans? Are there modeling guidelines? Do we need template employer information requirements uh, for our clients potentially that we can sort of share and distribute within the business and, and help and support each other for? And then the other key area that's really emerging in the last few years in particular has been around design automation. So our process, reviewing our own processes around design automation, you know, trying to remove where non-value tasks are happening and seeing how we can kind of use automation to support that. 
And at the same time with that, we're doing that with computational design and generative design is being explored as well. So, you know, generative design is still in its very early infancy. And so, so we're, we're doing proof of concepts of where, where the markets might um, have an appetite for some, some things like this and, and where, it's, where it's heading towards. Moving on to technology as well. Um, so for technology, you know, the, the technology is actually the least of the problems, least of the challenges and least of the cultural issues. Um, but what one of the, the things we make sure we always do with our technologies is that we, we work with our main software vendors to make sure that we're using the best that they have and that the most advanced tools that are available to us that we, we purchase of them. So we keep a good eye on what are they doing for us and how can we work with them on those things. Uh, we begin to like when you know you started seeing them connecting the dots for the different state different typologies of, of BIM for example earlier but we start seeing well how, how do we define the solution architecture for that and how can we um well, how can we scale that up and deploy that and there is such as keeping a strong focus on startups and when I mean keeping focus on startups so it isn't singular startups although that's obviously very appealing um, we do focus on singular startups but from my perspective it's more the broader what type of startups are emerging and what sort of um where are they sitting within within the bim uses let's say or the digital digital uses if to look at it broader you know is it because there's disruption about to happen in a specific part of bim that that hasn't been there before when you read a lot of the digital transformation stuff from other industries they they often say that the, the first things that you see when a disruption is coming is a lot of startups emerging in a specific part or a specific aspect of that of that um, delivery so for us, if there's a specific aspect of BIM that is changing because lots of startups are emerging, then clearly change is happening and we need to kind of start planning how, how that will impact and how we become you know, closely, um, closely embedded and involved in that. And then the final one on that is obviously keep a strong focus on the roadmaps of the existing technologies. You know, the technology companies that we all work with in our big companies, um, they themselves are making sure they want to stay relevant for the future. So for them as well, it's important that they understand what impacts are coming, what changes are coming, how is it going to impact us in the future in terms of them being relevant, especially as startups emerge. So we, we keep a good eye on that. We speak to them when we expl they, they explain they're always very open to talk about their roadmaps because they want to make sure that you are still involved and engaged with them in the future. So those, those are key areas with the technologies as well. This is a slide from last year from me. So th this slide last year was one where I'd, I'd read about the um, top 10 te uh, strategic technology trends that were emerging um, for our industry in particular. Um, it, was, it was released yeah, last year and we, we internally um, reviewed it and I explained where three key areas for a company like Arcadis we need to be, make sure that we are, we are fully engaged with. And the three that I, 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 I just decided on at the time was um, to do with autonomous things, digital twins and, and immersive experiences. And there was, there was some reasoning behind that. Um, the autonomous things, for example, was because the, the drone surveying uh, costs were actually in rapid decline in terms of what it would cost to get a survey done. So it was clear that more and more clients were going to be going down this route of asking for this rather than using 2D information that didn't have any embedded data in it. Um, things like digital twins, which is a huge topic um, in the industry at the moment. Um, it was an area, again, we needed to expand on and then and review and then look at and make sure that we're engaged with for, for a few reasons, really, because this I felt was coming from a few multiple directions. One was to do with the IoT piece, which, um, which is going to get even bigger once 5G starts to play a part. But it was also for aspects such as um, such as solution host, cloud hosting of data for our clients, which more and more clients were asking for this, even if it wasn't for the operate maintain stage always. Um, it was even just for the hosting of design and build stages of projects. So it was clear that we had to have a good solution about how we are going to be delivering this and, and how what options we have available to us and frankly, what BIM uses are they appropriate for. And then finally was the explosion of, of um, of basically the augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, again, the, the, none of these are surprises for probably most of you on this on this call. And um, the important thing was that you you, you embraced it and you, you you went okay right. How what's our plan with this as we see it? Because again, just to remind everyone, I'm, I'm all about year one to three. So I saw that in the next three years, these are areas that are moving fast for us. And, and, and yeah, so I'll be doing the same at the end of this year, going back through reports, looking at where the trends are. And I still feel like even for the next few years, 
these are areas still that are going to be very valuable and very important that we are fully engaged with. So with that, because I know it's been speed, um, I'll probably open it up to questions. Thank you very much, Andrew, for your very interesting presentation. Um, now we can use the time to have some questions. We would like to invite you to participate as our community of practice because we want to hear from you what are the challenges or barriers that you see in order to implement BIM in, uh, um, for especially building, uh, for building renovation. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you have any question, please raise your hand and don't forget to uh, unmute yourself so we can hear you. Um, let me check the chat box. Mm. Okay. I, I, I have a question, sorry, here, Fernando Sitcha speaking uh, of the European Builders Confederation, uh, BIM Speed uh, Project Partner. Uh, a quick question because maybe I, I missed the info uh, by your colleague from Arcadis. Um, my question is the following. I heard that you have a focus on startups and uh, here at the EBC we represent construction SMEs and craftsmen. Maybe I missed the info, but do you also have uh, uh, specific actions targeting uh, the traditional construction companies in the sense that uh, we, we, we know that most of the actors in the sector or SMEs and with less than 10, 20 people and we know that they're struggling uh, with the digital transformation so uh, um, maybe I, I, I lost the info if you said something or if not do you have anything uh, in your approach uh, regarding BIM uh, for this kind of companies? So, I mean, for the smaller and medium enterprises, I mean, from, from my perspective, I, I didn't include any, um, anything from my side from that, to, to be honest. But I mean, you know, and, and, you know, I think for companies like ourselves, where, where there clearly is a focus on it is, is moving away from detailed design. You know, that we, we're all, you know, the McLeany curves and everything, um, that I'm sure a lot of you have heard of and seen before, you know, explained the fact that we, we were probably going to be moving much forward in, in the stages of a design to construct um, because of the opportunities that, that it gave. Now, obviously, it did also mean that there was going to be a huge amount of data that was going to be needed to be uh, refined and decided on much earlier than, than usual expectations for construction, um, which that has been a challenge through the years. I mean, I'm, I'm nearly at 14 years in, in kind of the BIM, the BIM game, if we, if we can call it that. And, um, and, you know, that those challenges were always the, the fact of the complexity that was happening at the beginning. And I do think some of that is getting easier for even the SMEs in terms of um, that, you know, reality capture is starting to come into play where we're not potentially going to be having to model everything that's always been um, needing to be modeled before you can even start doing design work. So, you know, point clouds and things like that will we'll start taking away the part about, you know, how much we have to actually have as a context before we can start designing. Uh, for, for the smaller companies, it, it is a challenge, absolutely. I mean, construction companies are, are, are in, a, in a big challenge themselves because their margins are being squeezed. And, you know, BIM for them, I feel, is, is focused on de-risking projects and trying to, trying to make sure that they come in on, on target in terms of pricing. So um, for the SMEs, I do think that there are some challenges around the financial sides of things. I do at the same time think that some of the large software vendors, the obvious ones that you can kind of think of, um, will, will have some problems as well because, you know, the SM, there are startups emerging that are um, emerging that are giving opportunities at a much lower price for, for some of the softwares and applications to help develop BIM for small and medium enterprises that, that haven't been available without heavy investment from, from the software side of things. From a processes side, it's the same. Same kind of things that, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's with the smaller, smaller companies, it's more about, um, you know, trying to get much more structured. It's actually a little bit easier to structure a smaller company, I think, in terms of standardization and templates and getting, getting that side organized. Because the, the larger companies have a lot of historical kind of baggage that comes with them. So that you're having to do a lot of fixing from, from that side in terms of trying to bring people on board. Uh, hopefully that kind of helped your question, but I, I understand that it's definitely a challenge for, for small and medium enterprises, but I do think that, that there is going to be much more market for those because I do think projects are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and a lot of the larger companies are likely to keep going for those large projects and maybe focusing less on singular smaller projects unless it's a very specific client that, that is a strategic of importance to them. 
Okay, thanks. Okay. I would have a question. Um, I don't know if I have to raise my hand. Yeah, I see. <laughs> uh, my name is Juana from Demo Consultants from the Netherlands. Um, very, very nice presentation. Um, quite complete, I, I would say. Um, Thank you. I was wondering, um, how do you see it, um, that immersive experience that you were talking about in the last slides? Um, that's a trend that it's going to happen and that is already happening. But how do you see that uh, really being implemented in the um, in the deep renovation uh, by, and by adopting the BIM? So I'm, I'm seeing I'm seeing them split splitting at the moment. If I'm honest, I'm I'm seeing virtual reality um, splitting away from augmented reality. Um, what I'm what I'm starting to see signs of, and even this week at a conference I'm at, I'm seeing even more proof of that is that um, virtual reality seems to be focusing much more on, on selling mar the marketing of fixed positions of interiors of buildings and specifically. So when it comes to yeah, VR, it seems to be fixed positions inside buildings, finely polished renders so that it looks like the final product. Um, especially, you know, the, the example I've often used for this is retail projects where um, virtual reality has had a good part to play because in, for, the, for the retail market, it's not really about outside of buildings. It's usually been about the spaces that you're creating inside the buildings. So, so there's ends up being much more focus around really nice renders to, to, to give the um, opinion of what it's going to look like or give, give, um, give ideas of what it's going to look like. Augmented reality, on the other hand, though, everything I'm still seeing, and even this week, I've, I've just seen Microsoft talking about HoloLens 2 and, and every case study they've ever, they seem to ever be showing seems to be around, um, around construction stages and around refit, refurbishment works. And it's mostly to do with the fact that there's, they, they're moving towards potentially having GPS data um, linked to HoloLenses so that client, so people on site can start to see what changes might look like for a refurbishment. So I think the HoloLens, the augmented reality world I feel is moving far less into the more polished but much more about geolocation. And I feel like the, the virtual reality is, is moving much more in terms of the full experience. Thank you. Um, maybe I also ask a question. Um, I know that we also have architects among our uh, audience. So could you please elaborate a little bit more on generative design and uh, Arcadi's approach toward generative design? It might be also interesting okay. for our architect. Yeah, I'll see. I'll see what I can, <laughs> um, what I can share. I think. I think generative design is going a few different directions. I mean, um, one of the main areas I'm seeing generative design move fast is well. There's there's two spaces I've seen from, for example, Autodesk lately. Well, one has been around um, space planning, um, and they, they. I think they're having some use cases internally around how how we defining of space spaces could could be impacted using generative design for optioneering um, but but the other side is to do with master planning and then there's startups emerging where they're wanting um, for architecture in particular master planning where you, you have a site already um, that you've decided on for your project um, you draw the you draw the, the red line on the space in generative design as to where your plot will be and then, and then generative design starts to put in ideas of, of, what the, of what the volumes of those spaces and those buildings will be based on what their occupancy types might be and the relationships to other aspects, such as if it's mixed use and things like that. So I, I think what I'm seeing in the short term at the moment is lots, of, lots moving forward in master planning, specifically around generative design, and some for where there's very good restraints around space utilization on floor plates. Thank you. Okay. So if there are not more questions, then I would suggest to move to the next presentation. Thank you. No, thanks for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Andrew, for, for coming in. This was a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. No problem. Oh, good. Good. It's, thanks, teammate. It's, it's very helpful for our project as well. Um, right. That's good to hear. So enjoy the rest of your evening i guess and thank you and yourself team i'll speak to you soon cheers yep. bye, bye bye um okay marco <coughs> yeah i think i'm the next one yeah can you share your screen is it yeah yeah okay great second. can you see my screen 
Yeah, we can see that. Okay, perfect. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. I am Professor Marco Nesano from the Italian University, uh, Università Politecnica delle Marche in Ancona. And this morning, I'm going to present what we are doing in the BeanSpeed project about the performance benchmarking and energy efficiency assessment, or can we say about the overall performance assessment building for the building for innovation. So what I'm going to present, just one second, it's not changing. Okay, okay, it's working. What I'm going to present, so will be uh, the performance assessment approach that we are going to develop, that we are developing and that we are going to implement in the BSpeed project. So the set of KPIs that we are going to use and how to fit these KPIs with the use cases uh, and the renovation works uh, in all the, 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 the life of the renovation, so from the before until the post-occupancy evaluation. Uh, and finally, uh, we'll, what is the, the framework and the dashboard that we are going to create for building performance assessment. Just one quick presentation. As I was saying, I am a, a professor uh, working in, in the Italian University, which is located in Ancona, Università Politecnica delle Marche. And we are part of the Department of Industrial Engineering and Mathematical Sciences. Within this department, we are the Sensors and Measurement Research Group, which is highly focused on the different topics uh, on measurements and service development with the focus, with the high focus on smart cities and the built environment. So this is a large group composed by uh, five professors, uh, different lecturers, uh, PhD students and so on. And we are really involved in a European project. Actually, we have 11 uh, or 20 projects active um, with different of this were different of this project. Some of these projects are related to buildings and uh, smart cities. So say that I would like to, to start discussing the performance assessment approach that we are developing. Uh, as you know, when we talk about renovation, the, the first questions and the first challenge is how to do a, a complete and a credible and accurate assessment of the performances of existing buildings. Because a lot of that are uh, often are missing, so there is the need to, to have a, a, an holistic approach in the collecting the data. Uh, after that, we need to understand how to elaborate and process this data to, to, to calculate the performances that are not only related to energy efficiency, because as Timo was saying at the beginning, it's easy to, to save energy, you just switch everything off. But we are putting a lot of attention on the human aspect in the performance assessment. So yes, energy performance, economical side of the energy performances, but always related to the indoor environmental quality and users and occupants experience. So, that's why we want to create this holistic framework where we take into consideration all these different aspects. And to do that, uh, and to do that within the overall renovation process, so from the beginning, where the building is existing, where the building is occupied, uh, until the final stage of the work, once that the renovation is completed, and then we have again the occupants in the building and the building is again living its normal life. We need to have everything in the same. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you now, but you were disconnected for a few seconds. Oh, okay, sorry. So what we're saying is that we, um, since the, the, the performance assessment is something that needs to be included in the old life of the renovation, there is the need of a container, and this container at Beam Speed is the Beam platform. For this reason, what we are doing is to start from an overall data collection process where we collect data from uh, surveys, but also from sensors and the innovative sensors. And data are not only related to the building uh, uh, and building components, but also to um, indoor environmental quality and user perspective together with the energy. So starting from this type of uh, uh, complete data collection system, 
we are able to create the beam model. And from the beam model, we are also able to extract automatically with the beam to beam approach information for the building energy simulation. So given this, this situation, in beam speed, we are able to have the complete picture of what is happening in the building, uh, both from the measurement side, so real data, but also with the simulated data. And the simulation are calibrated using the measurement data and everything is inside the platform. So what's that we have these two, uh, let's say digital and real information of the building and we can simulate the building. What we can do is that we can use all these multiple sources data into the performance assessment where we can evaluate through a set of KPIs the performances of the building, the building as it is before renovation, and we can also simulate different scenarios of renovation applying a different solution. And we can assess the performance that we can achieve with these different scenarios using uh, tools like sensitivity analysis and certainty analysis to understand what, what can be the best set of renovation that optimize not only the energy consumption. So having these, all these together, we can create this platform, provide information for the decision making process, and then we can use the same performance assessment frequency, uh, and we can check if the, the, the performance that we were expecting during the design had been verified or not, or if we need some refinement to adjust the final performance. And this approach is... Yeah, I'm sorry for that. I don't know why. Actually, I'm also connected with the cable, but it sounds strange. Okay. Uh, okay, so I don't know where you uh, listen, but... I, what, what I was saying is that um, having this type of performance assessment approach requires, uh, it is really complex because it requires several types of data, data formats, and so on. So for this reason, the bean speed approach uh, based on this platform uh, can help us to, to, to put everything together. So to, to put in place all these different tools and methodologies. So say that presented this kind of approach, how do we uh, achieve this? First of all, through a set of KPIs for performance assessment. The KPIs is a metric to, to, to obtain a measurement on a scale. And a KPI is a, a way to simplify the data, to simplify the information about how the building is performing so that it can be used for the design, for making decisions and to communicate also to non-technical users what, what we expect from the building on how the building is working. So to justify the design choices. When we talk about building renovation, KPI is really fundamental because this can support the implementation of the sustainable renovation. Uh, and it, it is really important to communicate to the different stakeholders why the building needs to be renovated and why a certain choice has been done for the renovation. And the KPI is also a measurement of how much we achieved the EEB goals with the renovation. So in BeanSpeed, the KPIs has, uh, has been developed so that we can have this list of aspects that can be assessed from, for the building, and then uses this framework of KPIs, we can, pre, we can create a set of use cases to calculate it, to put in place the, the, the use of those KPIs. And then we can use these KPIs to evaluate the baseline, so the building before the renovation, to compare these performances with, this, with the other buildings, to compare these with the national regulations, and then to compare these performances with the different renovation options. So to develop these KPIs, we got the experience from other experiences of other European projects like P2 and Zool project, like the Renozet project and so on, were different of the BeanSpeed partners 
are uh, are of help be, have been evolved. And taking this overall global set of KPIs, we took those ones that could be useful for the beam speed renovation. And we created the three levels of KPIs, environmental KPIs concerning the energy, so operational energy, total energy, and sub KPIs to understand the different uses of the energy in the building, and also the, 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 the global impact. So we created this category of environmental KPIs. Then we created also the social KPIs. As I, I was saying in, in the beginning, uh, we want to put the user and the occupant in the, at the center of the renovation, the center of the building performance assessment. So we included different KPIs for the complete assessment of comfort and how people is feeling inside the building, considering both thermal comfort, visual and acoustic comfort, fuel quality, indoor air quality, which is really important for buildings renovation. Uh, as you may know, a lot of buildings after the renovation has the risk to become tight buildings with a really low ventilation and the indoor air quality uh, risk to, to become really poor in renovated buildings. So, so for this reason, we included this set of social KPIs. And finally, we included also some economical KPIs to, uh, to calculate, to assess if the renovation scenario is uh, sustainable from the economical point of view or not. This is the basic set of KPIs that we created, and this is a kind of living object in BSP projects. So to, um, so to check in the next future, in the, in the future of the project, if there is the need to include other KPIs or sub KPIs that can come up uh, during the development of the project, also with the changing of the state of the art in the field of performances uh, evaluation and benchmarking. Now, what we are doing in this moment is to fit this set of KPIs with use cases that need to be fitted with the different renovation stages. So we are working on this tree view, taking into account the different stages of the renovation, starting from the existing of building data, uh, the renovation design, the performance analysis, execution of works, and the post occupancy evaluation and maintenance. And what we want to do is to include the KPI to, to create the use cases that are, uh, let's say, the K enabling tool to calculate the KPI, starting from what kind of data needs to be collected, how to process this data how to use this data until the, the end of the renovation process. And finally, just to present what is the idea of using uh, or how we want to use this framework is to create a kind of simplified KPIs dashboard where we have a first level, first layer, layer with uh, some main KPIs to provide a, a simplified overview of the building performance. Uh, from the, the both comfort, uh, energy, and the uh, economic point of view. And then to link with the second level layer of KPIs, for example, when the, maybe the user want to um, um, investigate more the energy consumption, then using the, the second layer of set KPIs, the user can investigate how the total primary energy is used uh, uh, with the different uh, um, end uses of the energy building. And also with a third more detailed layer where we want to include additional information, more detailed information that can help to understand how the building is performing and to provide also more information about the, the aspect that can have a high impact in changing the performance of the building. So in this way, we want to include this further layer so for more detailed analysis of the building preferences and then uh, this this dashboard have the scope to calculate the, uh, and to include to embed all the calculation methods with the different section subsection also providing different alternative calculation calculation that can that maybe depend on the different location of the building the different aspect of the building and so on so thanks for, for your kind attention.
And the, uh, with this slide, I conclude my presentation. I'm available for any questions or part and explanation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Marco, for your presentation. Okay, I'm looking at the chat box to see whether we have any question for Marco. Seems that there is no question. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there is no uh, an immediate question at this moment, maybe it's better to move on with the next presentation and then we will use the uh, Q&A session again for the questions which might pop up. Yeah, okay. Uh, Agnieszka. Yes, I will share my screen, okay? Thank you. Do you see it? Yes, we see it. Okay. Uh, my name is Agnieszka, and as I was introduced uh, by uh, Sama, I'm responsible in the project for the coordination of the uh, demonstration activities. Uh, because what is very important that our project would already would already have has said Timo is not only about uh, research uh, and new technologies, but also application of those um, new things on the construction sites. And this is extremely important, extremely challenging. <clears throat> and uh, I would like to give you an overview how we are planning to do that and what activities we uh, have taken till now. So firstly, in my presentation, I will give you the list of the demonstration project. Then we will talk more or less what is our idea, idea for the demonstration. And uh, I will give you a short um, recap of the undertaken activities. Uh, so uh, firstly, at this moment, we are planning to uh, validate uh, our tools on 12 demonstration buildings plus one that is pending, so we will have in total 13. Um, in general, those are the residential buildings and we have uh, a demonstration site in Spain. We have a demonstration site in Germany, uh, two demo sites in Warsaw in uh, Poland, uh, one demo site in Romania, uh, two demo sites in Bulgaria, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, there is a mistake because one is in Italy, then we have Gdynia, Poland, and so one in the Netherlands and two residential buildings in uh, uh, France. As you see, we have really a lot of the demonstration buildings. So uh, for sure, it will be very challenging, but we want to show that uh, our solution and tools and the Crocky platform can be applied on various um, type of the demonstration uh, sites. And also with different scope of the renovation and some local national um, constraints. Here you can see the list of the demo sites and uh, a table um, in which we are saying how we are going to validate the tools. In general, the construction process, uh, we decided to split into phases. So first one is gathering the information about the building. As you know, often uh, for the old building, we have old uh, 2D uh, documentation drawings that often are not actual anymore. <clears throat> uh, the next step is the renovation design. Mm, next step is the uh, performance of the simulation, including the building energy model and energy simulations. Um, next step is the execution of the renovation. And the last step is the monitoring. So here on this, uh, in this table, you can see that, um, for instance, for the execution on, of the renovation, this phase uh, will not be validated on all, not all, all demo sites, but it will be done in the in the Spain, in Germany, in in Warsaw, in the Netherlands, and in France. As probably you may mm, accept expect, uh, this part will be the most challenging in, and difficult because it means that 
uh, during the renovation process that will be paid and performed by the building owner, we have to implement uh, the BIM tools on the construction site during the renovation. So in my opinion, this is also, this will be a real, real test for the BIM. Mm. In the SBIL data acquisition and BIM modeling, uh, uh, here we are thinking about the 3D scanning, about the uh, thermal scanning. Uh, mm, with the renovation design, uh, here our goal is to find and to choose the best solution, also in agreement with the energy simulation and other key performance indicators that are important for, for our project. Here, um, because later uh, my colleague from Spain, from Vicesa Oscar, will tell you more about um, the demonstration site uh, in Spain, on which uh, many activities have been done. But here in general, I will give you a short uh, overview about what we did. So firstly, we are using our clock Crocky platform to store the information about the old project. It's very convenient because often, as you know, uh, there are different uh, versions of the documentation. So now we have everything stored in one, one place. Uh, we have done a 3D scanning. Uh, we are proceeding with the BIM uh, modeling also for the Spanish uh, demo site and for the Germany, the energy analysis uh, is uh, being processed and the thermal sc scanning. And now I have uh, some uh, news, uh, very last moment news about the Berlin demonstration project that is a multi-story residential building uh, located in Berlin. As you see, it looks like, a, I would say, traditional uh, block flats, uh, constructed with the industrialized prefabricated methods. Uh, so uh, firstly, uh, mm, University of Berlin, uh, they did the beam modeling. And what was very important is that the beam model uh, really you know, reflect the actual uh, condition and uh, what is going on in the building. So we have uh, the actual Mm, as built uh, design. Mm, also some on-site inspection uh, needed to be done here. Uh, then the embodied energy calculation for the uh, demolition new build was, uh, was performed. And some different analysis also for, for different option of the, of the renovation. So uh, here, for instance, you can see and probably understand even uh, if you are not uh, German speaking that uh, CO2, mm, the CO2 levels were, were calculated or the cost per square meter of the, of the renovation. Mm. And here are also very last photo from the yesterday and today the thermal scanning is being proceeded. Uh, so uh, this is the thermal scanning of the of the building that uh, we are doing. Everything this is connected with the beam, and we are planning the the next steps uh, for the uh, for the project. I have to admit that uh, in general it's very it's very difficult to make a demonstration activities. So uh, for me, research is like. Uh, a key point, but also the demonstration project are the uh, are the key points because here we are checking if what we develop really fulfill the real life and the real life requirements. Mm. And after my presentation, Oscar will give you uh, more about the more information about and detailed information about how the uh, beam speed tools. Mm, and solutions are implemented on the Spanish demo site. That's all. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Agnieszka, for the um, introduction to our demonstration cases. As uh, Agnieszka explained, we are uh, planning to test our methods and tools, which will be developed during uh, BIM Speed project. We would like to test them and apply them in several demonstration cases. Uh, um, so um, we would like to know if you have any question uh, regarding the process. Um, I will have a look at the chat box. Okay, if not, uh, then we will continue with the next presentation. Uh, Oscar will present us uh, in detail what we have done in one of our demonstration cases in, in Spain. And uh, then I would like to uh, encourage you to, to um, give us your input, uh, especially from your point of view, from practice, what are the challenges that you see, or if you compare it with your own projects, what are the, what are the suggestions that you might have for us? Um, that would be very valuable for us to um, develop further. Um, okay, uh, Oscar, could you please start with your presentation and share your screen? Yeah, okay. Good morning, everybody. I try, but I think Agnieszka should uh, close the uh, screen sharing. Otherwise, it's impossible for me to do it. Uh, okay. okay, now? Yes. Yeah, perfect. We can see your screen now. Okay, perfect. So, welcome uh, everybody and thank you for participating in the first industry day of uh, BIM Speed. My uh, name is Oscar Bell and uh, I'm uh, uh, an architect from Vicesa and also I work as a technician uh, in uh, refurbishing and regeneration. Um, well, Vicesa is the leader of the Spanish demo case, but also uh, LKS, CIPE, Cartif, Fachada, Architectural Spice and Mostosal are involved. So what I'm going to present is uh, just uh, all the works that we have uh, carried out in, in the last, uh, almost last year, okay, since we, we started the, the project. So first of all, who we are, uh, it's important to realize that uh, Bicesa is the only public body in BIM Speed project. So as a public body, we have very strict regulations to ensure uh, our main goal is to promote high quality subsidized housing in the Basque region, only in the Basque region. And also we promote and participate in urban uh, regeneration, renovation and refurbishment, because uh, the Basque government thinks that there is the way to improve quality of life of citizens and contribute to the region's sustainability goals. Uh, our company was set up in 1990 and it means that uh, in the last uh, almost 30 years, we have developed uh, over 12,000 social housing and we are ongoing with uh, another 4,500. Um, this SSI is composed mainly by the bus government and then we have the public uh, main financial body of the bus country and another uh, private financial uh, entity. Uh, as an example, uh, this picture that you can see here is the, the, the tallest um, uh, building which uh, fits the passive house standard in the world. So, uh, Bicesa somehow uh, works in the, in the vast uh, construction society like the tractor for many um, improvements. So, we like or we are one of our goals also is to test uh, every new methodology, every new technique, material. So that's why we are involved in Beam Speed project. So the the presentation uh, will consider different aspects. First of all, the introduction to the Spanish demo case, the works that we have uh, carried out, a timeline uh, according to Beam Speed, because this is a difficult part for us because somehow we are advancing. Uh, compared to other uh, demo sites. The next steps, uh, particularly for the Spanish demo case, some ideas uh, that we should consider. Uh, we, they have uh, Timo and, uh, and Agnieszka, they have mentioned the Crocky collaboration platform, and I will just mention a little bit more, and some lessons uh, learned uh, from the moment. I think the last part will give us the opportunity to discuss uh, about the, the demo sites in general and particularly in, in Vitoria. 
So first of all, I would like to introduce the place, okay? Vitoria is uh, located in the north of Spain, in the Basque uh, region. It's a medium-sized uh, city, almost 250,000 uh, inhabitants. Uh, it's quite compact and it's surrounded by, by uh, very nice uh, mountains and, and landscape. And it's uh, quite accessible, it's a proximity city, uh, people like to walk, uh, ride a bike, but uh, even we are in Spain, don't think that this is the sunniest place uh, in Spain because it's just the opposite. It's one of the coldest cities in, in Spain, as you can see in the, in the picture. Um, our demo sites are located in, in the area of uh, the square of Coronación, okay? Coronación Square is uh, located uh, very close to the old town. So uh, it was developed during the 1940s uh, and 1970s. And uh, it's important to realize that this square is not homogeneous. My point is when we, uh, when we think about demo sites or, or, or demo cases in neighborhoods, um, sometimes we try to, especially in the European projects, we try to choose a very uniform uh, neighborhood. And this is just the opposite with this uh, challenge for us because uh, we have communities here uh, composed by three owners and we have communities composed by uh, 76 owners. So, and buildings are uh, different in, uh, in construction, uh, different in, uh, in the high orientation. So it's quite complex um, for us. So the scope of the renovation works uh, is mainly uh, one, to improve the energy efficiency, to reduce the CO2 emissions, which is perfectly aligned with the beam speed uh, main uh, goals. So how are we going to do it? Uh, the first step is uh, insulate the whole buildings uh, with two main possibilities, the ethics or ventilated facade. And the second one is to implement and connect to a new district heating. Uh, this second part is really hard because in Spain we don't have the culture of community uh, district heating systems. So how every apartment has uh, its own uh, heating heater, individual. So um, people are quite uh, concerned about moving to a community uh, system. Well, this, this um, uh, neighborhood also is part of another European project, the Smart and City project. And we choose this area because it was a degraded area. Uh, buildings, not any building has uh, insulation. All of them were built before 1980. The degree of conservation was really bad or the, the average was bad. I think that's really, really important because uh, we realized that uh, if we go to uh, propose a renovation as a public uh, body. Um, if we only talk about energy efficiency, nobody gets involved. So somehow, first we have to solve the real problems in terms of um, conservation of the buildings. And then as an additional and important uh, thing, once we renovate uh, the building, we introduce the energy uh, efficiency concept, okay? because we are in the smart city project as well. Uh, private uh, owners uh, have uh, at least 54% uh, of the cost, of the total cost uh, granted. And depending, because uh, remember that our focus was social uh, housing, depending on their incomes, they can reach the 100%. So from this uh, area, we have chosen two buildings for uh, the Beam Suite project. So these are the, this is the main idea or the summary of uh, the, main, uh, the main works. Uh, in terms of the facade, we are going to insulate, uh, but the carpentry depends on the current uh, status of the building. Uh, in, uh, for instance, in, in, our two dem in our two buildings of the demo case, in one it's not necessary to change the carpentry and in the other one, yes, so you will see uh, the impact in terms of uh, economics uh, that uh, this decision will, will have as well. So, uh, important because we are, um, our final customer is the private uh, owner, or the inhabitant of the building. We have to uh, ensure the close contact with the neighborhood association. We have to keep uh, up to date with the information for each community and each doubling 
proposing different uh, options, okay? Uh, that's why we opened a citizen information office in the, in the neighborhood. And another relevant thing in Spain is that um, when you are going to renovate any community uh, part of the building, uh, you need the 60% of the agreement. And in this kind of buildings, uh, there are um, commercial businesses in the ground floor, and then the rest, there are uh, residential apartments. So their interests uh, are slightly different. So to get the 60% of the agreement is uh, really um, a hard uh, task. So here we are, the first uh, building, a multi-story building, eight uh, apartments in, floor, in four uh, stories. Uh, it's located in the street Aldave 26, that's why uh, we recognize it as uh, Aldave 26. Uh, as you can see, the, well, the, the main facade looks quite nice, but the rear facade, uh, is, uh, it really needs a, a, a renovation. So the, the main approach is that uh, to check the energy consumption uh, as a KPA uh, right now, uh, before the renovation, and as you can see, it's, not, uh, it's quite low. And after renovation, the idea is to get the highest uh, uh, performance um, energy certificate according to the Spanish uh, regulation. For that, we have to check the transmittances of uh, every element. So in facades, the, the transmittance should be less than 0.211, also for the roof uh, and, and for the floor which uh, separates the first, uh, the ground floor from the first apartment, then uh, we can be 0.04. Important that uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, energy performance is aligned also with the general idea of the uh, Vitoria Town Hall which uh, idea is to reduce the CO2 emissions in residential sector uh, for the whole city by 2050. The second demo case is located uh, very near uh, to the other one, it's uh, Manuel de Arcaya 5. In this case, we have also uh, four stories, but uh, we have 12 uh, apartments, residential uh, apartments. In shape, is a slightly different. The first one was a, a used shape, and this one is like an H. So it's important because even we are, um, we are improving uh, more things and the cost will be higher for this uh, particular building, uh, the energy performance uh, is even better in the other one. It means that uh, orientation is important, the shape of the building is important, uh, because sometimes with less um, money, you can uh, get better results. So as you can see here, the, we have uh, also the same um, approach and uh, also the idea of the, of the town hall is to reduce the energy demand up to 50% in residential sector to 2050. Well, what we have done, uh, as a public body, we can't tap the shoulder to anybody. So everything must be really transparent and public. So we have to launch the public tender to get uh, an architectural office. And well, the, the reality here in Spain is that the beam implementation is quite low at all levels, even the, also at design uh, level. So the final, the AWD was a, 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 an architecture studio whose experience in beam was quite, um, Quite low. Anyway, they are they are doing uh, as the best as the as they can. And the second point was uh, starting to collecting uh, all the data of the of the building. So first of all, we went to the archive because there there wasn't any uh, plans uh, available apparently. Uh, then we visited every every apartment to check not not only what we as a technician see, but also the feedback of the people because they are living there and they have a, a lot of information that we have to consider, okay? Uh, and then the, we included the, the first certification and this certification uh, that you have seen already because uh, in Spain is compulsory for all the buildings that are older than 50 years old. Uh, 
uh, it's compulsory to pass a building technical inspection. And in fact, this is sometimes the best excuse to propose a, a big uh, or, or an interesting renovation uh, of the buildings. So here are some examples of the plans that we started uh, working with. And this is a little summary of uh, several information that we uh, already collected. Uh, important because our main goal is to um, work uh, or into the roof and the facades. We need all the information that uh, is already there in the facades. We started from the carpentries, but we have to identify if they have any element to have uh, some plants, uh, clothes hangers, etc. Because uh, uh, in the project, uh, they will have a, in, an impact, uh, um, an economic impact. And also, if we are going to plan the site, it's important to realize that which things uh, we have to remove before starting uh, starting the site. So, and then in colors, uh, we summarize the, the general uh, status of the buildings uh, of the building in terms of carpentry, humidity, etc. Second, uh, secondly, we we decided to create uh, the beam model, and we started uh, with a three D geometrical scanning. Um, well, uh, this is uh, the um, we didn't go into the into the apartments because uh, the beam uh, the beam methodology uh, for us uh, is very important to do things according to the final um, scope of the building. So there is no point in having the best uh, and the most complete beam model uh, if you are only going to use it for a certain uh, purposes. So uh, we uh, did it this in, in March for both of the buildings. Uh, and then LKS, which is uh, the other partner of the, of the demo site, um, prepared the beam model we have already prepared three different uh, versions of the BIM model because um, uh, BIM to BEM, so uh, going to the building information modeling to the building energy model is not that easy depending on the software that you are going to run uh, at the end. So, um, well, uh, we are working uh, on that. The thermal scanning was done in, uh, in July, I, was, I will show to you later. And uh, we need the final, uh, we have already a final version from BIM to BEM of uh, only one building, okay? So this is the BIM, uh, the, the, the model. And as you can see for us, it was really important. Uh, I, we asked LKS to please include all the wires and all the different elements that are part of the facade. You can see also the, the clothes uh, hangers, and if any uh, window is uh, closed or not. So uh, most of the windows are not the same. You can see uh, in the rear facade how windows are, uh, are moved. Uh, the the um, uh, size is not the same. So uh, if uh, we are going to talk about energy performance simulation, we need to have very accurate uh, detail of the, of the facade, okay? A uh, very important thing also was to parameterize uh, uh, every material because uh, we are different uh, stakeholders working here. We have the architectural office, we have uh, LKS modeling, we have SIPE uh, to uh, do the energy uh, performance, BCS as well. So uh, we have to agree how to parameterize all the building, both in current status and in uh, renovated uh, status. The thermal scanning was quite, uh, quite nice because even it was July, um, during three days it was extremely hot, extremely hot for us here, it's 35 degrees. And then the next day uh, when we started doing the scanning, the temperature dropped around uh, 15 degrees. So the, the, the building and the structure kept the heat but the external surface was um, um, colder. So it was very easy to realize where were the thermal breaches, uh, even if it was uh, summertime, because usually we have these images in winter, but uh, because we had this particular condition, deep conditions, it was very easy to realize where 
uh, were the main uh, the main problems. Even in this in this picture on the low part in the left, we can see the secondary structure of the concrete slab. Okay, because they have um, uh, they were in, in in higher temperature compared to the compared to the rest. So. Uh, the idea is, well, we have uh, done already the first thermal scan in summer after renovation, uh, be, uh, before renovation, I'm sorry. Then we are going to do the same in January before renovation and to check the real quality of uh, our um, refurbishment, we are going to do the same in summer and in winter before uh, after renovation, okay? In parallel, we have been working with the project uh, itself because the project at the end uh, must be uh, agreed and must be approved by the community communities. And at the end, uh, it's really helpful to have uh, the vision, the digital vision of the final status because most of the people, they are so far away from technology and they need images to, to, to realize what is going to happen in, uh, in their building and why, why are they paying for, okay? So as you can see in Aldave 26, the final, sorry, the final um, uh, idea of the project is to have ethics in both of the facades, whereas in uh, Manuel de Arcaya Finco, we will have a ventilated uh, facade and also we will add uh, new carpentries. That's why the difference between one project and the other is around uh, 100,000 euro. Uh, according to the calculations, we need to get this uh, energy performance. We need uh, 14 centimeters of uh, insulation. Okay. Um, important to consider that um, if we think only in terms of energy, uh, we add the insulation and, and that's good, but we have to consider also security uh, against fire, okay? Because our idea is every uh, work we do, it shouldn't um, de de reduce the uh, good behavior for um, fire. So we have to add several Somehow we are dividing the facade in different sectors, okay? Even if it's uh, only a, one building and one sector, we needed to divide in order to get control in case of, uh, of fire. So we launched the, the procurement process to have a contractor in September. And by the beginning of the next month, we will have the, the offers and we hope to, to get a, a contractor around the January of the, of the next year. At the same time, important because we are focused on energy, we have to monitorize uh, all the process. Before, by uh, asking bills to the owners, uh, during, once we install the insulation and after, okay? When we install the insulation and also the district uh, heating, system and of course our idea is to introduce this sensor into the into the beam model let's see if we are able to uh, have uh, um, data in real real time we hope so so this is an example of the bill because at the end for the for the neighbor what is important is how much how much are they how much money are they going to to spend and the lower part, you can see that the district heating is a big business of a big uh, issue now uh, for the toll hall. So the first tender uh, was uh, the cert. So all the applicants uh, were refused and probably uh, in two months, they will start a new, um, a new public tender to get uh, the district heating uh, become a reality. The timeline through beam speed, uh, as you can see here, the demo cases finalization is in the month number 42. So uh, our uh, demo case will finish, uh, the site will finish around uh, 20, the month 26. So somehow we are in advance. Uh, our idea is to be a laboratory for uh, the rest of the demo cases and for the, for the uh, project uh, itself. So right now, our next steps is to get um, uh, the BIM model for renovated scenario in uh, Aldave 26, according to the BEM uh, model, the previous BEM model. Uh, also, we, are, we have started with the second building because our idea is first start with one. When we check that all the methodology and the way to model was okay, then we 
we have started already with the second uh, second one. Fortunately, everything, all the models will be finished uh, before we start the renovation site. So uh, we are going to use it uh, depending on the contractor as well. But uh, uh, our experience is that there are several contractors interested in in, in doing the the refurbishment work, and they are. Um, they have already been implemented at a minimum level that it will be important for us. Uh, we are going to incorporate the, the virtual reality, okay, as well, uh, especially using the scanning, the fourth uh, uh, stages of uh, thermal scanning. And we are talking also about uh, using the twin digital uh, for, the, for the site. Uh, it's important when you go uh, step by step to uh, check uh, the main problems, okay? That's why uh, to the beam to beam uh, approach, uh, uh, we realize that uh, it is not that easy to do that, depending uh, again with the final software that we are going to use. So we are uh, preparing uh, in collaboration with CIPE some uh, guidelines to help uh, the rest of the demo sites. The Crockett platform uh, is uh, really useful, okay? It's a collaborative platform. Uh, just you need only to register. Uh, CSTV uh, offered that for the, for the project. But um, we realized that uh, it should be uh, in every country something like this. Uh, in fact, uh, here in, uh, we have already talked with the vast government because uh, we think that it's important to have a, a common frame for all the uh, users of uh, BIM methodology, if we really want to um, improve the use of, uh, of BIM methodology in uh, renovation work. So it's divided in the workspace and uh, in work every workspace uh, like BIM Speed uh, has different uh, projects and each project is composed by documents. You can uh, store documents uh, and uh, prepare meetings, uh, check the activities, uh, and also uh, we we haven't done yet. But um, uh, according to uh, Beam Speed, is um, implementing some uh, applications. We use them as an uh, external services for our uh, projects. Okay, this is the the way it, uh, it looks. So. Uh, just for finishing uh, my presentation, uh, several uh, lessons or several comments, more than, more than lessons here, uh, it's important to share information. Um, in Spain, the, law, the, the BIM implementation is quite low uh, at uh, every level, okay? Maybe designing is a bit higher, but uh, uh, in terms of uh, public administration is very, very low. Uh, also for... Uh, um, contractor companies um, at the moment, this is our main challenge, okay? Because we are trying to use a methodology which is not really uh, implemented in, a, in our country. Even our company needs to improve. So we see this uh, project as an opportunity, okay? The BIM for us is a big database and then uh, we are going to use the database depending on the, on the goals that, um, uh, and the scope of the renovation uh, works. The reality is that we have been working in parallel, two speeds. One is the, the, the beam speed and all the methodology. And the other has been the, the architectural office uh, um, way of working. Okay, so we try to uh, connect both of them, but we, we, the, we have to uh, say that the, the complete connection is, uh, is not uh, done. That's why we talk about the partial use of beam. So we didn't, we can't say that we use beam 100%. Um, there are difficulties in, in modeling from BIM to BEM, okay? It depends on the software, as I commented before. Another important issue is the distance between people and technology. Uh, we realize with uh, meetings uh, with different communities that they see us uh, like, uh, I don't know, uh, like we, we come from Mars uh, and, and suddenly we offer them a, a BIM model and they can calculate or they can see the energy difference uh, when we change uh, solutions, so and it's really difficult for them to to understand. What uh, people really like to know is uh, what you are going to do, how much is going to cost, and um, and if the building will be better and uh, if the value will be increased. So 
That's why when we talk about energy um, efficiency based refurbishment, we have also to consider the, the holistic approach of the, of the refurbishment. Crocky is a great potential platform uh, and they sh it should be, this idea should be developed, uh, I don't know, in other countries, at least in Spain it's not um, uh, available yet. Uh, this is a laboratory demo site. For us as a company and for the rest of the project, because we are a little bit advanced compared to the, to the others, and uh, we hope to conclude in, uh, for our company in uh, specific uh, BEPs, uh, tender specifications, and also we have to change some process and so on. Work is progressing, I think, okay. In terms of energy saving, we are going to reach the uh, main goal of the, of the Beam Speed project. In terms of time reduction, because BIM is not totally implemented or is very low implemented in Spain, we are trying to reduce uh, time, but maybe not up to 30%, okay? So that's it, uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have some questions. I have received them through the chat box, so I quickly go through the question. Um, question one is that um, uh, why did you why did you decide to model only the outer shell of the building? The internal masses are pretty important for the overall performance of the building. Um, there is a lot of energy storage in there. Yes, we. Uh, I'm sorry. We model uh, in detail uh, the facades, but obviously we have the slabs and we have uh, the doubling itself. What something that we didn't uh, do is just to model all the um, uh, partition walls inside each apartment, okay? Because for us, the idea uh, in terms of energy, we want to calculate uh, the energy performance of each uh, apartment, so not of each room. That's why in detail the facade, so because it's the, uh, the envelope, okay, the external envelope, and then uh, with the thermal conditions, we have uh, modeled the, uh, somehow the, the limits of each uh, apartment. But in, internally, um, we didn't go that, um, uh, that in detail because we considered that uh, it wasn't necessary. But let's see, because we are working uh, on that. Maybe at the end, we have to uh, uh, model this part as well. Let's see the calculate the, the simulation of the energy performance, uh, the results, and then um, we are going to decide because this is an open um, process for us. It's not uh, fixed. We are not following just, okay, let's gather all the information, let's prepare the BIM model, uh, uh, the BIM model until the BIM model is not uh, totally finished, we don't go to the next step. No, because we, as we are part of the other project, uh, the timeline is uh, both uh, beam speed and both uh, smart and city. So we need to take some decisions that maybe right now they, is, they are difficult to understand, but we had enough detail to get uh, an accurate energy performance, I guess. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, the other question that I've received uh, in a private chat is that um, what are, could you elaborate a little bit more on the cost uh, and uh, for example for a small office what does that mean in terms of cost? Uh, um, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, well uh, in terms of uh, cost I'm, I'm talking about um, in, in this, can you see the slide? Yeah. Can, yeah. Uh, this cost is only uh, the cost of uh, the renovation works in terms of uh, construction, okay? Apart from this cost, uh, there is the, well, the, the honorarium of, uh, of the, the architectural office. So, uh, in average, in average, for each uh, apartment, uh, the, the cost is around uh, 24,000, okay? All the taxes included. But because they have grants up to 100%, uh, but then the average is 45% uh, um, for the, um, uh, the owner, the cost is around uh, 12,000 euros. So somehow they are investing uh, 12,000 uh, euros, but the uh, works value is uh, almost, um, almost twice. Uh, the main difference, we realize that the main difference, at least in Spain, if you decide, if the carpentries are in bad condition and if you have to 
uh, include uh, new carpentries in your in your budget, then the, the budget uh, increases uh, rapidly. Okay, just uh, another difference is uh, to have a ventilated facade. Ventilated facade, uh, it's supposed to be a better quality solution, uh, especially in, 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 in the south of, of Europe, because it, it, they really work well, really well uh, during summertime as well. But uh, Vitoria is, um, uh, is a particular case because it's one of the coldest places. So. Uh, for us, ventilated fashat more than real uh, energy efficiency. We are talking about just the uh, final aesthetics image of the building. So some communities, they can afford, uh, as uh, MDA5, they can afford this uh, ventilated fashat. Some others, they don't have enough incomes to, to go to that point. So they decided to go to the minimum. So no carpentries and no ventilated facade. That's why this is the, the difference. So, but the average uh, is around 20, 24,000 uh, for each, uh, each apartment, the, the final cost. And uh, Oscar, the other question is that would the rent increase and how much in percentage? Yeah, well, uh, this, is a, this is a really good question, you know, because when we started um, uh, talking with the, with the communities, uh, they were, uh, most of them were elder people, uh, most of them were renting, okay, they weren't living there because right now the area is quite degraded. So uh, they always say, well, and, and how can I uh, get money from this um, refreshment? And of course, if you are the owner and you are improving the quality, uh, the, the comfort of your, or what you are offering, Obviously, you can increase uh, increase the rent. How much? Well, we we realized that they because we finished uh, several buildings already, and the rents have been increased around 10, 15 percent. So um, it's a good deal. Uh, well, I invest in in as an owner in my building in my apartment, but I can increase uh, the rent 10, 15 percent. This is the result, the, the feedback that we get back from um, from the customers. But uh, and, and the other uh, important thing is that uh, when you are on a neighborhood where the most of the buildings are not renovated, once you renovate it, the value of your property increases rapidly. Okay, and uh, this is something that we are realizing as well. People is even trying to sell their properties just with the idea of, well, this building will be refurbished, so uh, I can ask for more money because uh, the, the quality of the building uh, will and the value will be increased. So uh, the renting will be increased and it's already increasing and also uh, the value of the, of the properties are increasing in this particular area because the location is really good, it's very close to the city centre. Uh, okay, thank you. And I also assume that uh, the uh, bill for the energy will decrease as well for the inhabitants. So that's also uh, yes. I I don't have because I'm not in my in my uh, in, with my laptop uh, in front of me. Uh, I'm in the meeting room. But uh, we have already uh, monitorized several buildings, not this these particular ones, and the demand energy demand has uh, decreased sixty percent. Okay, great. Um, the other question is that I'm assuming the measurements are going to be done by room. Uh, so if you are going to compare measured with simulated, then it might be a good idea, uh, good idea to model the rooms. How do you see this issue? Well, our, our idea is to monitorize the apartment, not every room. Okay, that's why, because we don't have uh, um, enough uh, um, budget to install a, a sensor in every room. So for us, the important thing is the, the apartment itself. That's okay. why, that, that's why with uh, um, um, one sensor uh, for humidity, temperature, and also CO2 uh, levels uh, for each apartment, it's uh, it's enough. We we don't go. We don't need to go deeper. But you talk about um, uh, modeling with rooms. That's an interesting point because we realize that for all, for instance in Revit, you can model by spaces and and rooms. But uh, because we are using the CPE software, 
if you model uh, using only spaces, then the CP uh, software doesn't recognize uh, properly uh, the spaces. So at the end, we are uh, we are um, modeling room by room, but introducing just a, a very simple uh, partition wall. Thank you. Um, uh, there is also another question. Um, it's actually related to your last uh, uh, slide in your presentation about the lessons lear uh, learned. Uh, that was actually a really good slide. So the question is how BIM Speed is trying to tackle these issues and um, is it at this moment being used as a collaborative platform or not? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, it's a collaborating platform, but because we are um, uh, developing uh, the final models of the two buildings, both uh, before and, uh, and after, uh, we use the platform as a, a, as a place to uh, share information. Okay, that's the, one of the main ideas of the, of the platform. And we hope that we can also use the, the platform um, during the site, but uh, also we we depend on the winner of the public uh, public tender. Uh, how are we uh, tackling these this, uh, issues? Well, it's not a, it's a good question. It's not uh, easy because, um, uh, as I said before, uh, people are very uh, far from uh, technology. So uh, somehow, what we are doing is. Uh, teaching these both communities, how can they understand the uh, maintenance of the building for the future, okay? This is the good idea to engage people. Once you have your BIM passport of the building, then uh, you have a, a virtual, uh, a digital model, and in the future, it's supposed to, to be uh, the, main, um, the main tool to keep the uh, maintenance and operational uh, up to date. So, well, we try to use the BIM uh, use cases possibilities to engage people and to avoid some of the barriers with them. Uh, okay, thank you. And the last question that I have at this moment is, uh, can you explain a little bit about BEM and how to go from BIM to BEM? Yeah. Um, when you use a general modeling program like uh, Revit, uh, usually the idea is to introduce uh, as much information as you can, okay? But then the reality is that um, uh, programs like uh, Revit or Archicad or Vectorworks are not uh, ready to um, directly um, make an energy performance. At least in Spain, the software must be uh, approved by the Spanish government. So, at the end, if you are if you are interested in uh, in uh, having a model to simulate the energy performance, the key is uh, how to how to export the Revit or Articat model. Okay, that's why uh, from CPE we are collaborating with them as a partner of the consortium uh, to realize how to model. Uh, which kind of data are the minimum inputs that um, uh, that we need, and then how to export to IFC and use the IFC to create uh, the the BEM model. So uh, it's uh, quite complex. Uh, I'm not an expert in uh, in uh, in CP software or uh, just in Revit uh, modeling, um, but the main idea is to have. Uh, very clear the minimum requirements uh, when you model in order to uh, have a, a, an energy simulation using the, the CPE software. Uh, because uh, CPE is based, basically used in Spain, we are going to go further. And uh, the idea is to have uh, the minimum guidelines to uh, model, uh, to get the uh, building information model uh, with the minimum requirements to run different uh, energy energy engines uh, simulated um, to simulate the, the energy performance so uh, we are working uh, we are working on that uh, it's not uh, it's not just uh, easy it's, but it's not that complex that uh, we could think i think that the idea that we had the concept that we have uh, to consider 
is that uh, working with federated models. So there is a, a main model which uh, most information as possible, okay? But at the same time, when we export uh, this main model uh, to BEM, for instance, we don't need to export everything. We just need, need to export the minimum uh, to have a, a, an IFC ready to um, um, run in different energy simulators. So at the, at the end of the, of the demo site, um, we will have these guidelines very clear. Thank you very much. I think you very nicely uh, summarized uh, um, what actually BIM Speed is trying to do in future and also the, the challenges that uh, uh, we are facing and how we are going to tackle them. Um, so um, I would like to know whether we have more questions or not. Um, and maybe Timo, you as project coordinator, would you like to add something? If not, then we can conclude this session. Timo. Uh, thanks, thanks, Emma. Yes, I think um, we conclude. Um, we are right at the time that we had for the session. I hope it was interesting. And um, as I said earlier, I hope to hear from you and um, like give us your comments, stay engaged, um, spread the word to others. Right. Hopefully, um, in, in our next community of practice meeting, we will have four times the participants. So I'm quite happy with who's who's here today. And um, yeah, it is very important that you know a lot of people will know about our project in the future. And um, with that, I close close the meeting. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you very much, Timo. I would also like to add that all the information uh, from this session will be online uh, in our website. So uh, thanks again for your participation. And if there are more questions, please do not hesitate to email us and uh, be st uh, please stay tuned about the upcoming de uh, developments of BIMSpeed and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, thank you and I wish you a great day ahead. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.